Roger, it is great to talk to you again. Welcome to the show. How are you? Well, Jason, great. Uh, in these unprecedented times, it's nice to be able to talk to someone who's, uh, I guess, uh, a dean of the automotive industry, and you have your tentacles in all parts of the sport, and uh, uh, I probably could learn a lot from you, and maybe I should be asking you the questions today <laughs> rather than you uh, having an interview with me. You are, you are way too kind. It is always great to be in your presence. We've, of course, had a lot of opportunities to do that over the years. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to start with the feeling that you had when the checkered flag dropped at this year's Indy 500, and perhaps how you felt when it was complete. Did you get a moment of reflection? Could you have taken a moment to think about what you had accomplished after, of course, the struggles of last year and then acquiring the track just prior to that? Well, you go back to January 6, uh, 2020, uh, and within 60 days, you know, the dream, you know, was almost broken because with COVID arriving and the shutdown of the country, and we obviously understood it. Indianapolis that, uh, that we were going to have a problem trying to have 500, 300,000 people, you know, at the speedway. So, you know, we went into a different mode at that point, uh, you know, basically trying to understand what the track needed. Uh, we had made the transaction. Uh, we were committed. Uh, I certainly understood the inside of the track. I had really not spent a lot of time understanding the financials and let's call it the outside. But it was obviously there were things that we could do during this period of uh, COVID that could make uh, the guest experience be the primary focus, you know, for the new ownership, at least uh, until we were through this uh, treacherous time. And uh, stand there, uh, I, I was on the top of the pagoda for the entire race. I said, you know, driver, start your engines, which uh, I really had goosebumps, to be honest with you. While I was saying it, uh, it's uh, amazing uh, uh, the sight of uh, the military, the first responders, the healthcare workers, and, and the fans. And then to be able to go up on top uh, and and watch the race, you know, I had uh, uh, timing equipment up there so I could really understand who was doing what. I could see more than I see when I stood at the box for, you know, for four years or whatever it's been. But it was a sigh of relief, to be honest with you, that there were no any accidents that would have been we didn't need. Uh, the race was terrific at the end. Uh, I wish that uh, Elliot would have been driving our car. But on the other hand, the fact that he was able to use his skill base, which he learned under our, you know, auspices, was amazing. And uh, you know, my, my daughter was there. My boys were there. We're all up on top, some of our key people. And uh, I think we all pumped fists and said, wow, it's over. And went back uh, and start, start thinking about where we go next. Knowing you, you went back to work. Probably like like the Super Bowl when it ends, you start on the, you know, the team, or the uh, the NFL always starts on the next Super Bowl in the next next few minutes. You have the utmost respect for history. How important was it for you to make sure that there was an Indy 500 this year? Well, it was it was mandatory because the fan base there is generational. When you think about 500 hours after the race, we expect to have sold this year 150,000 tickets. In fact, through yesterday, we had uh, almost 60,000. I think it was 65,000, to be honest with you. And so it's generational. And to me, if we lost that connection and people started doing other things on Memorial Day and not coming to Indy, you know, we'd lose that, that fan base. And, and I just didn't want that to happen. On top of that, with all the discussions about uh, uh, opening up events, indoor, outdoor, I felt that, that we would be the catalyst for helping to open up America. And that's exactly what we did on Memorial Day with 135,000 of our 235,000 seats being occupied. And I know it looked like there were more, but I can tell you, we had 134,670 people. We sold tickets to for seats. Now you had your suites and you had the industry, meaning the teams and what, but that was it. I mean, we were, we were spot on with what we committed to the city. 
It was a fabulous accomplishment, and indeed, it, it was a reopening of America to some extent. Roger, I want to take you back. Your first visit to the track was in 1951. Your father took you there. You were 14. Seventy years later, you're standing there saying, start your engines. Um, you, you went to the, your first race was the 35th Indianapolis 500. This was the 105th, as you told the crowd. And back when you were 14, Lee Wallard's Roadster rolled into the winner's circle. What do you remember about that day? Well, I remember, uh, uh, Jason, uh, my dad had gotten some tickets uh, from a, someone that uh, he worked with. So he and I drove from Cleveland uh, to, to Indianapolis. And I remember we were invited to someone's house for lunch and got there late and everybody had already gone to the track. But we went in and there was a show car, if you can believe it, back, you know, 70 years ago or whatever the number was uh, uh, in the backyard. I remember getting sat in it and got my picture taken. And maybe that was the, you know, the injection I needed about racing. But uh, we then went over the track. Uh, our our seats, uh, seats were off a of turn four, not great seats. But, you know, to see the race and, and just uh, for something gripped me at that point and said, boy, this is something that I, I want to be involved in long term. I'm sure I don't remember that, but I'm sure that's what it was because I was at every single race following that 1951 until we had the split, you know, with, with championship auto racing team and, and USAC, I guess you would call it at that particular time. And uh, uh, I never would have believed and no one else would have believed uh, that I'd stand uh, you know, on the winter circle and be able to have gentlemen or drivers start your engines in, in 2021. I mean, but that's America. You know, that's us as individuals uh, living in a society that gives you the chance to perform uh, in your business, uh, uh, you know, build a family, uh, not only your own personal family, but the family of companies. And today we have some 65,000 people. And it was a uh, it was a business that uh, once I got racing was, you know, no one tells you how to go fast. No one gives you a setup. You got to make it happen. And that's exactly what I've tried to do, uh, you know, in my life, uh, you know, not only personally, but, uh, you know, from a business perspective. You had long discussions with Tony George, who approached you about the sale of the Speedway. How did that conversation come about? Well, I was at the Brickyard uh, in, in 19, uh, in August. And up in the pagoda watching the, the brickyard, and I saw Tony and his wife. In fact, said, "Roger, I want to get together with you and talk to you about the future." And you know, Tony's always thinking about maybe what else we could do as a as, as a as a franchise meeting IndyCar. And I said, "Yeah, I'd love to get together with you." And, then, and we dropped it. I went out and watched the watched the uh, the NASCAR race. And then fast forward to September, we were in uh, in Laguna Seca on the grid you know, for the last race, uh, uh, for the championship. And, uh, he came up to me again and he said, look, I'd love to get together and talk to you about the future. I said, well, look, uh, uh, let's get together in Ind Indy. And I said, depending on what happens in the race or who win the championship, I'll be there, you know, in a week, I'll get together with you. And we kind of, we won the championship. I connected with him on Monday and said, look, I'll see you, uh, on, on the day that we had the dinner and basically, uh, he and Mark Miles met with me and Tony took me through quite a dialogue of, of the family, the trustees and looking at how to, how to really monetize their investments for the, for the future of the grandchildren, et cetera. And, uh, I said, well, I'd be very interested. So I said, I didn't want to get into an auction. Uh, I understood the inside of the track, but didn't know the outside. And quite honestly, I think within a week, you know, we had signed an NDA and I met with Mark Miles and one of his key financial people here in Detroit. And uh, we started the process and within a month, you know, we announced that, uh, you know, we had a definitive agreement to uh, buy the track. It was, uh, it was fast, but on the other hand, we kept it very confidential because what I didn't want to do is get this thing into an auction. And therefore uh, the confidentiality was uh, absolutely something that we had to have. And, the good news is it really came out as a surprise. Not that the surprise was important, but more the fact is we were going through the diligence. We didn't need to have disruption. 
And what a pivotal moment for the George, uh, you know, the, you know, the Holman legacy that has existed at Indianapolis forever uh, for them to decide to do that. Why was it important for you? Well, uh, number one, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm born with a car in my garage. I worked on cars. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a car dealer. Uh, I was a racer. But more important, the experience that we had buying the Michigan Speedway, having Nazareth, building California, owning uh, the track in uh, North Carolina at Rockingham, partners with the France family and, and Homestead, all of these things, when you look at it, we had the experience and we certainly had a team within the company that understood, you know, what, what owning a racetrack was all about. And uh, when you think about the most iconic track in the world uh, and you had the opportunity to buy it, it wasn't so much about the price. It was more about emotion saying, hey, this is a great opportunity uh, and, and I'd love to have this for my family for the next 75 years. And we talked about it internally within the family. We all agreed, let's go for it. And it was it. And that was it. It's amazing. The kid from Shaker Heights, Ohio, going to the Speedway at that point, uh, whose father wasn't even a, a race guy, right? Your dad was an engineer born in 1900. But he had this work ethic, right, that transferred over to you. What was that, Roger? Well, he always told me effort equals results. In fact, uh, I carry a coin in my pocket uh, uh, every day that has uh, effort equals results. And I have a big one in my office. Uh, let me show it to you here. Uh, that uh, they gave me after 50 years uh, at the truck leasing business. I guess you can't see it there, but... Uh, you can see the, hmm. the coin that I have. Yeah, there it is. And, uh, it really, he gave me the insight uh, of your card. You know, you'll, it'll pay off. And I remember when I wanted something, he'd say, look, if it's $10, you go out and earn five, and I'll, I'll support you with five more. And that's what he did when I wanted to get in the automobile business. And uh, I guess he talked about people. He said, if you worry about yourself in these businesses you're in, you'll probably fail. You worry about what's best for the company, and you work in that direction, you're going to be successful. I think I've used that as a, you know, as a key thing uh, as we look at our companies uh, uh, along the way. Your first job in high school, I mean, you were born to be in the, car, in, the, in the car business. Your first job in high school was at Jaguar Cleveland. What did you do at Jaguar Cleveland at 15? I would uh, wash the cars. I said, I was, uh, that all the mechanics, they'd come off the boat. I'd clean them, put the license plates on, but what I got to do was drive them around the block. And I didn't got to work for nothing because I could drive these cars around the block and, and then get them ready for delivery. But uh, I was kind of an all around guy and the, the store was very close to my house. I could walk there from where I lived. And uh, that was uh, that was my first taste of uh, automobiles. And I worked at a gas station, obviously, you know, prior to that at 13. So you spent more time you once said in the garage than you did in high school. That's correct. <laughs> you got into racing, but it wasn't it. it, it the your first incarnation in racing uh, didn't last very long. Uh, tell me about your father's Buick. Well, you know, drag racing was something. I went out to Akron to the drag show. Art Franz in those days had the jet green monster. I don't know if you know about that. That mm -hmm. was a jet car, and uh, my dad had a Buick Century. And I remember I'd go out and race the. The, the 55 Chevy power packs. And uh, I remember I brought it home after one weekend and he got in the car to go to work on, on Monday morning and the whole transmission fluid was all over the garage. So <laughs> he said, that's enough of that. And how did you get your first car and what was your first race car, Roger? Well, I guess uh, my first car uh, would have been a MG TD that I got through my a relationship at uh, Jay Cleveland ultimately. Uh, and then I had a bunch of, uh, had a Ford, which I put a, a full race holes in it. Uh, I had a bunch of Oldsmobiles that I customized uh, uh, just as drivers. And uh, then uh, the first real race car was a Corvette uh, 57 fuel injected uh, car that was a competition Corvette, no heater in it, it's there metallic brakes. And that was my first car. I took my SCCA license, 
with that down at Marlboro, Maryland, and ran that successfully. And then the next car really was a Porsche Spider I bought from Bob Holbert, who uh, lived uh, south of Allentown or Bethlehem, where I went to college. You financed that first race car very creatively as well. Some people might not know that. Tell me that story, if you would. Well, the, the Corvette I had on a GMAC payment book, so I'm not <laughs> sure they were, they were aware of that. So I, I was making my payments of probably 30 or $40 a month uh, on that car, so I had to take care of it. That's wonderful. And how do you find your way into, uh, in the early 60s, into Formula One? And, uh, and, and, and how long did that, did that last? Well, I think the, the Formula One entry, uh, you know, really, you know, with Donahue and having the shop in the UK, uh, which obviously was uh, a success for us. We built a number of the Indy race cars. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, with, with IROC and with all the different disciplines that we were involved in, it wasn't possible for me to be active overseas and still have my business. And so we felt at that point uh, that we would, we would get out. And obviously with Donahue losing his life uh, in, in Formula One was really a point I thought I would stop, but we then got together and said he'd want us to continue. And we had the win with John Watson. But that was uh, short-lived, not because I didn't want to continue. It was more because of the schedule I had and the commitments I had in the U.S. We had the, we had the uh, business Penske Cars, uh, which was very successful, built some great cars. And uh, in fact, when you think about, you know, that uh, 78 Indy car and the 79 Winter Mirrors, that was a byproduct, you know, of, of, a, of a Formula One car with a Cosworth in it. But uh, it was primarily due to the fact that I could publicity for the company and what we could do, we get more bang for a buck here. And Roger, I want to go to the the first store that you uh, became involved in in Philadelphia, the Chevrolet store. Uh, you were working for Alcoa. You said you were the original tin man selling aluminum. And then you were approached by a gentleman named George McKean. And what did Mr. McKean ask you to do? George uh, and I were uh, members of the sports car club of uh, Philadelphia. And he was a treasurer and asked me to take over that job, uh, which I said I wouldn't. And unfortunately, he lost his son tragically. And he and I had gotten together and he said, Roger, how'd you like to come out and, and be general manager for me at the, at the Chevy store? Well, you know, at that point, uh, I think I was making $500 a month and I had the polo coat and a hat. I'd go down to two pence center. You know, you thought you were a real business guy. And, he offered me two thousand dollars to come out and work for the Chevy store. I couldn't get out there fast enough, but uh, probably went there George, that night. I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, George gave me the opportunity. On the other hand, I had to, uh, you know, I had to perform, and my, part of my commitment to him was I'd come out and go to work, but I wouldn't be able to buy the store, you know, within a couple of years. And uh, to his credit, he moved out and gave me the keys. And two years later. Uh, I was able, I quit racing myself, obviously, because General Motors didn't want to have, Rathman was the same way, you couldn't become a Chevy dealer if you were a race car driver. And on top of that, my dad had loaned me $50,000 out of his own personal account. He was retired and he said he'd go back to work if I lost it. Well, I was motivated to succeed and that gave me the first real opportunity. And then a year or so later, I raced the Corvette down in uh, Daytona. Uh, sponsored by Sun Oil, a gentleman, uh, Elmer Bradley, who's head of marketing and bought a car from us. And he and I talked one night, Sun sponsored the car. So, you know, Alcoa uh, worked for she for the Chevrolet store within a couple of years. Uh, I think it was February of 65. You know, we bought the business. And then we get into 68 and 69. You think about Trans Am and Camaros and what took place there and with Donahue. I mean, it just uh, it happened so fast. But the underlying foundation for all of this was certainly the Chevy store. Yeah, that Chevy store. And uh, you, you just mentioned a moment ago that General Motors had a policy at that time that if you were driving, they didn't want you also managing the store. So you're given an opportunity, again, back to Indianapolis and the theme here of, of Indy, that you pass up. What was that, Roger? Well, uh, you know, being a sports car driver and being a driver, I, I had gotten to know uh, – Jim McGee uh, uh, well, and uh, 
uh, certainly Clint Bronner, and they asked me if uh, I'd like to take a driving test at Indianapolis. And, uh, you know, obviously I was interested, but I couldn't get the time off. And, you know, when you've got a family and I couldn't get the time off from Alcoa at that point. And uh, Mario Andretti took his test. So I guess I went north <laughs> uh, and he went south or vice versa. He became one of the greatest drivers of all time. And I've been able to build a business, which I'm so proud of. So I think uh, the Lord looked down at us and said, this is a direction for you, Mario. Roger, this is a direction for you. You certainly both went in your own directions in your own ways. So, Roger, you, you've got the Chevrolet store that's in Philadelphia. Uh, you go to Detroit in the early 1970s. There is an opportunity to then uh, acquire another uh, store. And um, you were approached by a fairly legendary figure. Who was that? I guess, uh, I think you're talking about John DeLorean, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I got to know John, obviously, at that point. uh, You know, he was a key key leader at General Motors, and there was an open point in uh, in Michigan. And, uh, you know, I applied for it and was able to get that uh, and moved to Michigan, quite honestly. Uh, Got to know John over the years. Uh, You know, we rode motorcycles together. In fact, Keith Crane, uh, rode motorcycles with us uh, many times, and I remember uh, we were open on Saturdays uh, or at night uh, in Detroit at those days. And I was in the office on a Saturday, and I saw this man outside with a woman. And there was Keith Crane, and I went out, didn't know who it was, and he had just come to town, and he and I had gotten to know each other at that point. I invited him to go out to Michigan to the track with us to the Michigan Speedway. So you think about how we even we connect with you through this this whole automotive uh, uh, string of uh, mm-hmm. a, a different uh, occasions of, in our lives. And, uh, but John and I uh, became good friends. Unfortunately, he ended up uh, in the wrong place. But uh, that commitment there to go to Detroit and the opportunity to get closer to the GM people and the support we were getting from Chevrolet Engineering and all the times that I had known them when we were great racing the Chaparral, it all kind of came together. And, uh, you know, I've lived in Detroit, uh, you know, really uh, went to New York and uh, then for the Detroit diesel business then came back, been here ever since. And in 1969, you bought this little truck leasing business. You bought, you were a licensee, if you will, of, uh, of a Hertz uh, f- uh, franchise, which was a strategic move on your part that now I think probably most people, when they see the Penske name, uh, automatically, automatically think of of trucks and leasing and fleets. And so how did that develop, Roger? Well, really what happened when we were at the Chevrolet dealer in Philadelphia, uh, I became the national car rental uh, licensee in Philadelphia airport and built that business. And when they wanted to, the, the, the national headquarters wanted to own the big cities, I sold that enterprise at the airport or the national car rental franchise to the central uh, group and that money I used to buy the truck leasing business in Reading. It was called MM Waterbore, a, a Pens- good Pennsylvania name. And uh, we had 150 cars and 150 trucks and we were the licensee for Hertz in Reading, Allentown and Pottsville. And that really was the start of the business today that as I sit here today, we've got 330,000 trucks you know, on the road here in America, I think it's the largest fleet probably in the world when you look at it, even when you include military. And uh, but that was a real opportunity for me, and, and was able to grow that, uh, uh, making an acquisition and a partnership with Hertz. You know, many years later, which really catapulted us, and then bought uh, uh, some businesses from GE, uh, Feld Truck Leasing, and these things kind of helped us build that to where we are today. There's some acquisitions, but obviously a lot of internal growth, organic growth. And one key moment happens in 1999 with United Auto Group. And when you talk about really propelling the Penske uh, automotive business, that had to be a catalyst for you, right? Well, having really been in the automobile business, uh, you know, for a number of years, but it really uh, pivoted into Detroit Diesel and a lot of the other things we were doing, uh, I really wasn't effectively running a dealership at that point. Pat Ryan, who was one of my directors, said that uh, he understood that uh, the business uh, 
uh, at uh, UAG at that point might be for sale. So I met with the with the audit committee chairman, uh, Michael Eisenson. In fact, I met with the Butler Aviation at Newark Airport about 11 o'clock at night. And uh, we put a deal together that we would we would buy the, the New York Stock Exchange Company, and I think the stock was four bucks a share at that point. But uh, at the end at the end of the day, that was a, a real opportunity. And when you think about you know delivering today five or six hundred thousand vehicles on a worldwide basis, you know four continents and nine countries, and you know thirty thousand people, and you think with truck leasing that together over over sixty. It just it just came together so fast. It was hard for me to really understand how it did. But on the other hand, uh, my love for cars and having auto racing as a common thread through our brand name, it, it's really turned out to be a dream come true. It's probably more than you could ever imagine. I'm guessing. You know, I don't know that. Uh, you know, I'm the most effective as a forward planner. I'm more interested in the next challenge. And every one of these, I look for underperforming and undervalued. That's where I do my best work. You know, whether we, whether it was coming to India and not, you know, not, not having ever been there, going to Australia with a supercar, getting into NASCAR, all the things that we've done. But looking at these businesses and then growing a group of people that, that stayed, have stayed with me through many, many years, you know, low turnover, uh, you know, high integrity, full transparency we have with the group. You know, it's helped us grow the business. So I'm, I'm always interested in the next challenge. And my wife said, probably on my grandson will say, Mr. Opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Opportunity, indeed. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the Penske culture. Uh, there are many stories uh, that I've heard through the years. Uh, one is about the, the somebody who you had uh, interviewed for a potential position that was on an overseas flight and you know on a, on a long seven or eight, or eight hour flight this this individual uh, was going back and forth with you in Q and a and I mean just this conversational but exhaustive process and the plane lands and you're immediately going to either the next store or the next racetrack at just this relentless pursuit of as you said the next thing what are the threads that connect Penske throughout your different organizations? I'm guessing it's resiliency, it's a it's a work ethic, um, and it's an attention to detail. Am I right? Well, Jason, I would say that, that everything that I can tie to our success is about our people. And I think it's the focus that we have, and we say we want it hard to be, hard to get into this organization, and it's hard to leave. I've many times that people made a decision to leave the organization. I've gone personally. I flew to Atlanta one night where we had early days in IT. One of our key guys was going to go. I flew down there myself. And I think that, that we care about our people. And that, I think, culture goes through the entire organization. Uh, we're open, very flat organization. There's not anybody that works for me across the world can't come to my home, uh, uh, can't come to my office. And I like to operate not with a bunch of PowerPoints. I'd rather operate, you know, coming to your location, sitting down with you, working with you. And I tell people, if you have an issue, you call me because I'm going to call you. And I think it's this con connectivity that we have across all levels of the business. And we've kind of flattened that the management uh, curve to where we all, there's, there's no big shots. And I do what I do best each day. And I know there are people who can do things a lot better than I can. And once you realize that and you delegate and you have trust in people, uh, it just works. And, and you take more and more on and, and you know, it's just like the Speedway. Uh, you know, we hadn't thought about that uh, uh, maybe in July of 19, hadn't even thought about it. But I can tell you, as soon as it became a subject matter, our guys were couldn't wait to go. So that that energy uh, of never saying no uh, and, and wanting to succeed uh, and the challenge, I guess, is what keeps us together. I, I don't know how to say it any different, but I, I go back to uh, of all the great people uh, that have worked for us and the ones that still do. I mean, I think you you see, you know, many of them yourself. And, you know, we're going to continue. And this is our business. 
it's, it's our employees business. You know, we're, we're, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm an owner, not a custodian of our business. I'm a real owner. I've got my skin in the game. When I get up in the morning, I, I'm trying to make decisions what are best for the company. I go back to what my dad told me, not, not how much I'm going to make or someone else, what's going to be the best for the company. In many cases, it might be a disappointment for some of our people, but at the end of the day, one focus, mission plan, what's best for the company. Let's talk a little bit about automotive retail in 2021. Given your company's significant investment in automotive retail through the years, how are you thinking about the potential disruption to franchise values from things like electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, or even competitors like Carvana? Well, 2021, you know, from a business perspective, uh, it's been amazing. I mean, we really had a pivot there in the last six months of last year, you know, from a profitability standpoint, uh, you know, we took the position of not getting into an acquisition mode, more building a capital base where we've been able to reduce our leverage down to world-class levels. And then took a look into 21 and said, look, opportunistically, you know, we would look at making acquisitions. We had some open points you need to execute on. We made investments uh, in our in our premier truck group, which is a representation of Freightliner. But to me, right now, uh, under the current administration and not knowing, you know, really what's going to happen from a uh, sales perspective. And you said disruptors. Look, I take my hat off to Carvana. I take my hat off to Elon Musk and people like that. Look, they are on it and, and they're, they're producing now, maybe in a different way. But I think that, that we've got to be careful. Uh, the manufacturers, even when you've seen even Jaguar and Land Rover, the there's less pressure now to, to join Jag and Land Rover together, you know, in some of the stores we have overseas because of the investment. So I think they're learning in some areas, but for us to make these big CapEx investments and knowing that potentially all of the work, all of the cars are going to be at electrification, that won't be for a while. When you look at the numbers, we go, you took a 5% or 10%, you know, compounded rate for the next 10 years. So there's going to be a lot of business for us, but when you start to look at investing, and what we have to have from the standpoint of facilities, I think you got to pause. And that's what we're doing. We're looking at this carefully and doing it strategically in areas that we know we have a parts and service business. And I like our approach, which is diversification. If you look at it carefully, you know, we've got retail automotive, we've got retail heavy duty truck, we've got the investment in our truck leasing business, we've got overseas, we've got military. And all of these things, when you come together, you know, give us a solid base. But from the standpoint of uh, direct sales, uh, we're seeing more of that in Europe right now. Volvo just announced they're going to go direct on used cars. Uh, agency model is being discussed uh, uh, with uh, Mercedes-Benz. I'm not sure when you step back and you look at the success that a lot of these Niederlassens, the factory stores in Europe, they're selling all those now. And typically, you know, they've not been the most profitable. And I understand during COVID, people are using the internet, they'll continue, but still, people still want to have a place to go. And I think not buy everything online, certain things, yes. But when you get to a vehicle, from my perspective, you're still going to need a dealer because you're going to have technical issues, you're going to have financing, uh, you're, you're going to have used car trade-ins. There's lots of things that take place over allowances. And it's hard to do that over the internet. So I'm, I'm looking at that carefully and, and we're, we're going to have long discussions with the manufacturers overseas about that. Now here with the franchise system, at least Elon Musk hasn't put a factory in every state yet, so he can maybe get the rules changed. But, uh, I think that uh, it, it's, a, it's a point of concern for me, you know, going forward. The CEO of Lithia, another large public dealership group, has spoken about his vision of the consolidation of public automotive retailers. Have you considered the same? And if you haven't, why? Well, consolidation of the other publics, I mean, it depends on, you know, he's certainly in a different position you know, as a shareholder and, and, and the operator, uh, I think that, that we wouldn't take on a role like that at this point, even though we have the capital. 
I think what you really end up is because we have framework agreements. Remember, today we're only allowed to own so many dealerships and so many markets under certain conditions. And I think all of us, and I think all the, all the, our, my, our peers are great guys and they do a good, great job, not a good job, a great job. But we start consolidating and you get to that size, I think there'll be some pushback from the OEMs. I'm not sure that that could take place at this point. Maybe it can. I think he's done a great job buying some of these trophy properties that he's bought over the last uh, couple of years. And uh, I think they've done a, done a good job. On the other hand, you know, we're focusing on our car shop business. We're focusing, you know, on the other pillars of our strategy. You've also moved into some new areas in the last few years. You do a lot of business in Australia, Roger. Not an easy place to get to, but one that you find enormously appealing. Why is that? Number one, you got to go back to Detroit Diesel. We own Detroit Diesel. We were, we were actually the distributor in Australia, so I had time down there. I knew the country. Uh, so we made, had an opportunity from Daimler, in fact, to ask us if we wanted to invest there, which we did. And bought bought the truck uh, Western Star and Detroit Diesel business there back five or six or seven years ago. But we saw that market uh, is one that we knew. Uh, we were we were also had the opportunity to pick up the MTU franchise, which is the two liter, four liter, big uh, four cycle engine business. We had done business with them at Detroit Diesel, so we knew them, and that's given us, you know, a really a, a country approach to on highway and off highway marine and military when you think about that you know we're in programs for the next collins class repower of the submarines we're doing uh, uh engines uh for the frigates uh, uh for the patrol boats some on on land uh business for the military so we've got a military piece we've got our big engine business, which is uh, generator sets for these data centers. And mining is probably one of our greatest strengths with these big engines and these three and 400 ton mining trucks, because it's a great service business. And from the standpoint of parts and service, it covers 130, 140% of your costs. So we felt it was a diversification. It was a, it was a low cost of entry. Uh, you didn't have the CapEx in the way we do in the auto business, we were not interested in automotive there. This was, this was a completely different discussion. And that was, we're in the industrial business and we see this as really something that it's given us the reason to get into the retail truck business over here because, you know, we're truckers also. Uh, I want to point to something that somebody has told me about working within the, the Penske operation and, it, and you just alluded to it a, a moment ago with your military reference, that the Penske way you use the military school as a model to, for discipline within your organizations, no matter what you're doing, whether it's Australia or uh, on this side of the world. And an interesting did you know came up during the Indy 500 that if you replace flat top garbage cans with ones that come to a point, it drastically cuts down on the amount of random trash that piles up because people aren't able to set trash down on top of the cans. And you learn that by going to Disneyland and studying their methods of doing things. And Will Power, one of your longest tenured Penske drivers, said anyone who's ever worked with Roger, for Roger, or raced against him knows that nothing gets past Roger. You have an enormous attention to detail in that militaristic sense, don't you? Well, I guess you go back, uh, talk about Indiana. I went to Culver Military Academy during the summers for three years. He certainly taught you discipline. Uh, and how to take care of things, uh, uh, how to understand uh, leadership. And I think the, today, uh, the details are the things that can make or break you. And, and I want, I, I, good enough is not good enough for me. And to me, I love, you know, the regimentation. Uh, I want to have our brand be consistent. I want our people to be consistent in how they approach, you know, our guests, our customers. And, uh, I don't know. It's a DNA that I came from a good family. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, my mom and my dad uh, taught me the right things. I wasn't the best model kid, I'm sure, as a son. But uh, on the other hand, this part of uh, our company is important because you'll see consistency and, and longevity with our people. And, and I think I'm not sure we're military, but attention to detail. 
is wow. exactly what you need because when you think about winning the the 500, you know, look at uh, Dixon, uh, look at Rossi, look at and look at uh, Will Power coming into pits, look at at uh, McLaughlin. Six Sigma is not good enough if you're going to win the Indy 500. And a guy like Costa Nevis, he didn't make any mistakes. It was 100 percent perfection. And I think that to me is a perfect example of guys that had the capability but didn't 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 deliver down to the very last piece that they had to do from an execution perspective. I've heard you talk to a lot of people through the years. We've talked to, you know, numerous times, but I don't think anybody's ever asked you who your mentors were or who they are. Well, my dad, you know, obviously uh, uh, taught me early on, you know, I had a paper route. I worked at a floral shop on Saturday. So I could get my girlfriend a orchid corsage, I guess, for uh, for working for a few hours, um, always had a job during the summer, and uh, he certainly was a, a great. He's my dad, but my best friend. I just wish he could be here uh, today, and, and I'm sure he's looking down when we had the running of the Indy 500 to, to see what came out of that day. We were there in 1951, but. He would be my number one for sure because somewhere he and his his influence and my mother's influence have have made an impact it's hard to sew it in just where it was then i'd have to say uh, frank olson uh who uh was the uh ceo of hertz we bought the hertz truck division back in the 80s i used to go into new york every saturday and sit out with frank and he taught me you know, how to run a multiple location company uh, about metrics and, and uh, about business plans. And, and I think communication within their organization, he was a big help. And then, then to me, as I sat on, on you know, on the board uh, of American Express, people like Gerstner and, and Jimmy Robinson, and certainly Jack Welch, uh, Larry Bossidy, those people that were you know, running GE when I was on that board. These are people that being on a board like that uh, and, and those people being, you could be associate, you learn so much. And I'd say, I just a group of people. And, and you know, today, uh, uh, you know, I, I look at uh, the business leaders, uh, uh, people, Michael Eisenson, who's on, on our board, uh, he's been in the investment business. Uh, I go to him, uh, uh, Brian Thompson, our lead director. Uh, these are people that I lean on, you know, for advice. Uh, because I, I might have said it three times today. We got to get our guys the board to talk about this one to help us make a decision. So I'm not afraid to reach out, not one to one person, but kind of a cadre of, of, of leadership people that I can rely on. And and they're different subject matter in many cases. It might be a legal case. It might be something. You know, from a marketing, it might might be a financial. So, but uh, I'd say my dad was was number one, and certainly Frank Olson and you know Jack Welch. Uh, you know, at GE. You're an inspiration to so many, Roger. The people who I talked to, I recently talked to Zach Brown, who's the team principal, obviously the McLaren Formula One boss, who said that you're an inspiration for him. He actually wanted to know what you thought of him. Well, look, Zach. Uh, is a, is, a, is a great friend. Uh, I remember sitting with him uh, at the Indianapolis airport uh, at uh, Signature, and he was trying to determine, you know, whether he wanted to go to Formula One and run Formula One, or whether he wanted to, you know, run McLaren. I and mean, this is, uh, we had a very, very good conversation. And uh, I got to give it to him. I mean, he, I thought that was, was a pretty big, you know, missions that he was going to try to accomplish but uh done a great job with mclaren he's a good de great deal guy there's no question he's smart uh and he's tough uh all the communication all the things about, that go on in racing you know he's bulletproof as far as i'm concerned and uh, uh he knows what he wants people trust him and he delivers uh he delivered in his business sold it and then he's doing what he loves to do be in racing and uh uh, I, I congratulate him for it, and certainly the, when you look at uh, the success of McLaren here over the last 
several months. He's put the engine piece together. He's put the driver pieces together. He's certainly put uh, the people in place. You can see his uh, his uh, fingerprints on the on the Indy, the Aero McLaren uh, IndyCar team. You can see that he's even influencing some of that success. So uh, I respect him. He's a great competitor and a guy I like to be. I know he will appreciate hearing that. When you think about your NASCAR championships, your Indy 500 championships, you got one piece that I know you still want to hit, and that would be almost finishing the Triple Crown, and that would be Le Mans, right? Are you is that? And, and you talk about wanting to take on the next opportunity. That has to be it for you. Well, I guess that's one mountain we haven't climbed. Uh, I raced there myself back, you know, many many years ago with uh, Rodriguez. Uh, I think it was uh, 73 in the car that Phil Hill and Jundabin won the race the year before. And then we had the Sunoco Ferrari there, you know, a number of years later. And at that point, we've never been able to put anything together where we could race, you know, for, for the win at Le Mans. And I think the experience that we had with the IMSA racing with Acra was very important to us. And with Porsche looking for a partner, and with our commercial relationship, plus the experience we had with them with the 917, 10, and 30, the Spider, you know, later on uh, win the championship. All of a sudden, the pieces were in front of us. It was a matter of sitting down with Porsche. And we didn't just want to run an IMSA. We wanted to have WEC, too, because we really wanted to be sure that any knowledge we could get from racing, the team, the people, the engineering, and the things that we could do were would give us a chance to compete at the highest level of Le Mans. And I think uh, we're thrilled. Uh, we're, we know we're going. Uh, we're making plans now. Uh, we're getting people in line. Uh, it's it's going to be a real journey. And it's a long-term uh, relationship, too. You know, we have two years before we race. Uh, and yet the homologation goes for five years. So you could say if we're successful, this is a long-term program so uh, i can't wait to go and uh, you know we're preparing you know different options you know for us to be able to have some capability to understand how to run that race with our people going over this year looking at it seeing things that we don't know because they never run there and uh, do we take a look at uh, racing there and something else uh, in 22 you follow me to actually just play the golf course. It's just not hit golf balls off the practice tee. So <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a lot in it, but it, it's it's a, a real challenge for for the whole organization, and you know we're thrilled. A couple of favorite indie or NASCAR moments for you, Roger, that come to mind. Well, the probably the one of the favorite moments uh, at Indy was. Uh, in 94, always the first win was special, but 94, we had the pushrod Mercedes engine. I remember when Dieter Zetsche and uh, Jurgen Hubert and uh, the whole team came over and they had their suits and ties on. They came in the garage and they stripped down and put the Penske Mercedes white shirts on and went up to the suite and to see those cars, you know, take the lead and run the way they did. And, uh, win that race uh, was that was so special because helmet werner was the one that helped us make that happen he was a leader there uh in fact i think that should work for him at that point but that we kept it quiet announced it about three weeks before the track opened and then to blow everybody off and then have them change the rules a week later reduce the boost and then finally just you know outlaw the engine was that was a special moment there's no question from a from a nascar perspective uh, I'd have to say uh, uh, you know winning uh, a cup championship there was special uh, because guys like Hendrick and, and you know Gibbs and, uh, and, and Roush and, and you go on Petty and I, all those groups of, you know they're specialists there and for us to be able to come in kind of the outsiders and win that that was a with Kozlowski was special and then to back it up with you know, with Logano uh, in today's competitive world was was amazing. And uh, uh, it just, it was another 
mountain that we climbed and uh, we got to put our flag in the ground. You have 13 grandchildren, right, Roger? Right. What do you teach them? What do you try to teach them? Well, interesting. I had uh, three of them at the 500. Uh, they all were up on the top watching the race to someday. One of them might be the one saying, driver, start your engines. You never know. Mm-hmm. But um, they all work. Uh, two of my grand uh, uh, sons uh, that are 14 and 15 worked out at the track in Indianapolis last year for two weeks. They'll come out and work three weeks this year. They're painting barrels, putting stickers on barrels, uh, raking sand traps, uh, doing all the things that a young kid has to do. And I tell my daughter and my, my sons that, uh, you know, new hockey skates, new skis, everything you need. But at the end of the day, you got to ground yourself. So what I'm trying to develop with these kids is not only a responsibility for the family and to society, but also you know, they've got to be able to work with people at all levels of society. And I think that that's what you do when you go to work the Speedway, just like I have, or you're delivering newspapers. Uh, kids don't do that today. So I want them to uh, uh, understand how lucky they are and appreciate, you know, what their parents are giving them uh, from the standpoint of opportunities uh, to go to school, good schools, and also have the things they want in sports. But uh, uh, and it's love, I think, at the end of the day that uh, you want to give these kids. Uh, uh, you know, one of my grandsons broke his wrist here playing lacrosse here. He was at the race at Indy, and he's playing lacrosse later in the week. So that's how fast these things, yeah. you know, can happen. So, but we got a great family, great kids. Uh, fortunately, my my sons uh, uh, are all been successful in their own way, and uh, we all get together because a lot of the younger grandchildren are at the same age. So. They're the, they're the common glue, the common thread from a personal standpoint that makes a difference. And my wife's been terrific uh, in putting up with me over these years and <laughs> also hurting all of, all of us together when we get together uh, each year at Christmas time and certainly as we go up to uh, Nantucket in the summertime for a week. Final one for the captain, and I want to thank you again for your time, Roger, but final one. When you do decide to retire in another 20 years, how many people will it take to fill your job at Penske? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, we've got a good succession plan. I think that, uh, uh, you know, we have businesses today that are running fine. I mean, I'm, I'm there from the standpoint of our, our routine meetings uh, and, and, and input. Uh, but uh, look, we've got uh, a succession planning that's set up. Uh, you know, we're a private company, uh, so we have some opportunity to do things uh, that we want to that will give us uh, a line of sight on uh, leadership uh, for a longer period of time. But um, I'll let someone else figure that out. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go as long as I can. And, uh, you know, while I can, I'm going to try to be, uh, you know, part of a, uh, building a, a culture within the company, within the family that's uh, that understands the transparency, the integrity, and the hard work that's gotten me where I am. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Roger. My pleasure, Jason. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your program. Thank you. The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio.